Dr. Sonoli present positive. Seven o'clock in the morning to let stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Honorable Mayor Ron Chaver. Here. Council Member Dan Marler. Here. Christine Casto. Here. Allison Howe. Here. Clint Anderson. Here. Lisa Northrup. Here. Kevin Lindell. He has an excused absence. He texted earlier, said he would not make this evening's meeting. First item on the agenda is a presentation for bids on irrigation controllers. Mr. Duke. I could you go first tonight. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the purchase of irrigation controllers to be utilized by the Parks Cemetery Department with $23,000 in the 2016 capital budget. With this purchase, the Parks Department will be able to add new irrigation controllers to the cemetery. These controllers will allow the central the cemetery irrigation system to be controlled under the same central control system that the Parks Department currently utilizes. <coughs> this is a web-based system that allows all changes to the irrigation to be made from any computer via the internet. To be able to work with our current system, these controllers needed to be signature control system constellation series controllers. An advertisement for bids was placed on the city's website on August 25th and made available at City Hall. The bid opening was held on September 7th with the following bid received from DBC Irrigation Supply in the amount of $18,332. Therefore, staff is requesting council approval to accept the bid from DBC Irrigation Supply in the amount of $18,332 for irrigation controllers for the Parks Cemetery Department as they are the only company capable of bidding on this equipment. <coughs> this is the same equipment that you have at it's the park. It's the same uh, irrigation controllers that we have out through we have throughout the town. Uh, that allows us to. If it rains really hard on a Friday night, 10:30, I can from my house I can just get onto the website and with one click I can turn the whole system off. From takes about 20 seconds to do where that used to be a driving all over town to turn everything off. Cemetery doesn't currently have those controllers. To match up with these controllers, we have to get the same type, and it'll be on the same website, same uh, able to control those two, just like the others. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Dope? No, it seems like a good conservation thing. There you go. It does. It helps save water. It's real, really efficient. It saves me a lot of time. I appreciate it. <laughs> No questions, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution to accept the bid from DBC Irrigation Supply in the amount of $18,332 for irrigation controllers for the Park Cemetery Department. Second. I have a resolution by Christine Castone, a second by Lisa Northrup, vote by roll call. That resolution carries on a unanimous vote of six to zero with council member Lindell absent. Thank you. Next vote. Next we have a presentation on bids to overhaul an engine for our street department's dump truck. Mr. Willis. Or JW. JW. <laughs> Yeah, no one, no one knows who Jim Willis is. So. <laughs> yeah. Evening Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm here tonight to present uh, an in-frame overhaul for our diesel engine in our 91 Mack dump truck. Uh, the engine has over 178,000 miles on it and is showing signs of wear and lack in power. Uh, most of the miles and stuff put on this truck are in-town miles, which is very hard on these diesels. That's why it's uh, kind of deteriorating at a quicker rate. Uh, the engine, or excuse me, the, uh, the frame, the chassis, the box, everything else on this truck is in still pretty good shape, even though it's 26 years old. Um, but it, uh, uh, the engine is the only thing that's really showing the wear into it. Uh, if we put the money into rebuilding the engine 
I think it's better value than having to spec out 175 to 200 thousand dollars for a whole new truck. So, and it'll extend the life of this truck. I'm assuming by you know 10, 15 years. Like so. Um, an advertisement was put on the city's website on August 19th uh, and made available at City Hall. Uh, we contacted several other uh, mechanic shops, and uh, but only one uh, <coughs> submitted a, a bid form, and it was for Don's Diesel. And so staff is requesting, oh excuse me, uh, along with in the bid form we usually put in a section there for options that uh, the person may think that would interest us. And he said with that many miles and stuff on it that uh, a water pump replacement would also be uh, smart to put on this at this time. And the engine rebuild was $16,227.69. And the replacement of the water pump was $500, $576.37. The staff is requesting council approval for Don's diesel uh, in the amount of $16,227.69 for the engine rebuild and also the uh, $576.37 for the water pump. Um, we'd like to have this in amount not to exceed the $17,000 which was budgeted just to kind of buffer against any unforeseen things we make. There's not much of a buffer. Yeah, that's a very small buffer. <laughs> so is this just for the rebuild of the motor or is this re pull it, rebuild it, and put it back together in? Yeah, th what this will include is it'll uh, piston sleeves, rings, um, lower bearings in the lower end. Uh, we'll keep the same crank as long as it's still in good shape. Um, the cam and lifters and stuff were replaced oh, about four years ago, so those should still be in pretty good shape. Uh, this will also include going through the heads and, uh, and replacing anything that needs to be done on those when we manufacture them. So are we gonna pull the motor and take it to them or are we just taking it down, he's pulling it, rebuilding and reinstalling? Right, yep. Okay. And pretty much the engine one, they'll just pretty much do this in chassis. <coughs> so they won't even have to pull the motor. We'll be able okay. to do it all in the break. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Willis? Seeing none, I would entertain a resolution. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution um, accepting the bid from Don's Diesel and Auto Service in an amount not to exceed $17,000 for the rebuild of a um, the engine of a Mack dump truck. Second. A resolution by Lisa Northrup and <coughs> second by Christine Costeau. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thank you Thanks. very much. <clears throat> Next, we have a presentation on bids for the Acoma Avenue sidewalk projects. Mr. Curtis. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, third time was a charm. Um, this is a CDOT grant for uh, Acoma Avenue sidewalks that would extend from Main Street to West Street, both sides of the road. Um, council had accepted this grant back in August 4th, 2015. Um, took several iterations and reviews through CDOT. It's got to follow all their standards and regulations and contracts, um, even though it's an off system as far as they're <coughs> concerned. Um, we first advertised this um, according to CDOT's approval on June 21st. Um, we didn't receive bids. We put out bids again on July 14th. Um, again, no bids were received, even though we were having between four to six contractors that showed up. Um, we worked with CDOT to revise some of the concerns contractors had, in particular was the work days. Um, that was extended with their concurrence to 45 days, um, at which time uh, we had received three bidders, Can Do Concrete out of Greeley, Nora out of Kingsburg, and Custom Concrete Cutting out of Brighton. Um, through that um, process, we do follow CDOT's requirements, uh, generally following low bidder. It also has to be a Davis-Bacon project um, that follows federal requirements. 
um, as well as some of their award process, whichever is more stringent. Um, as such, staff is requesting council approval to accept the bid from Can Do Concrete Construction to construct Tacoma Avenue sidewalks for $240,799 and authorization to expend up to $250,000 um, as per in our capital improvement budget. Um, this is a 80-20 match project, so our contribution um, would be just under 54000 be happy to answer any questions you may have. So did we not get bids because of the time frame that CDOT put on them before or was it? Oh, it was a lot of factors. Um, when we first started going through the design, um, they changed their process. So I had to, even though we had engineers prior that was part of the coma project as a whole, had done a lot of that in advance. Um, as we went through our first review with them, they had changed some of their local agency project processes. And so I had to go back and redesign it and have several meetings with them. Um, from what the con contractors were doing um, in the middle of the summer and those kind of items, they were just busy with other projects. So um, they weren't really sold on doing it. They wanted to, but they wanted a little bit more lead time. Um, we did have before that it was a 21 day project in part we were trying to keep it under one billing cycle because the reporting we have to do for payroll and reviews and those kind of things um, sometimes becomes cumbersome for staff as well um, and that was partly what the state wanted to so after we told them we couldn't get any bids that's where we made some revisions and opened it up to 45 days and then these three companies bid on it so but a lot of it was timing. They wanted more time and towards November to finish it and a little bit more leeway worrying about weather and obviously with the school open now and those kind of things, they wanted to make sure to work around all the little feet running around wet concrete, I think, so. <laughs> okay. The, the obvious question is um, the gigantic disparity between the, and I, I want to call it Nora, but that's probably not right. It is. Between their bid and can do is. Mm -hmm. um, um, so again, it kind of goes back to um, CDOT and what they look at, even just to submit a bid. There's a lot of paperwork. You have to be a registered contractor with CDOT to even bid on these kind of projects. So again, that's why you don't see local agencies in here. Many of them aren't registered or to do that size of work. Um, but Nora's. Norris was higher because, again, it wasn't a priority project. They were going to get it. They are going to make it worth their while. Mm. And so that's kind of where they went back and forth. Um, the DBE, which is Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, where certain goals are established with CDOT, was 2%. Custom Concrete Cutting and Nora both were at about that 2% threshold, um, even though they looked at cost. But Can Do is actually a fully owned and operated DBE. So their goal is like 87%. And so that'll help the processes as well. But they wanted the job. All of them have done CDOT work before, but it went back to schedule, timing. They're using subs, those kind of things. Nora and Custom Concrete are actually on call, two of our on call concrete okay. guys. So that's why they were aware of it. But that's why we've been dealing with scheduling on getting things done in the city too, because all of our on call people are just still slammed on much larger projects. So. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Yeah. Curtis? <clears throat> um, once the bid has been approved, what does the timeline look like in case parents ask? <laughs> um, <laughs> so CDOT just gave us concurrence on this. Um, we recommended CANDU. We told them we were coming tonight. Um, CANDU schedule was projected to start middle to end of October. Okay. And so that was, again, that flexibility on deadlines that they would get rid of a lot of these other jobs and be able to free that open. So, but it's a 45 day schedule. Mm -hmm. Concrete can be done kind of in the winter months if needed to, but they're aware of all the extra blankets that they have to do and those kind of things. But it's scheduled to be November, which should give enough time for all the new paperwork we have to do with CDOT now once it's awarded, so. Great, thanks. Yep. Anybody else? If not, I would entertain a resolution. 
Your Honor, I would offer a resolution accepting the bid from Can Do Concrete Construction to construct the Acoma Avenue sidewalks for $240,799 and for an authorization to expend up to $250,000 on the project as needed. Second. Okay. <clears throat> I have a resolution by Lisa Northrup and a second by Allison Howe. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. Thanks, Brad. No problem. Next, we have an update on revisions to our sign code. Mr. Curtis. Thank you. Um, in your packet is a memo, kind of a summary of what's been going on. Um, this is part of uh, what's been on council's goals for years, as well as part of our uh, comprehensive plan continuation on updating the sign code. Um, also in your packet is the draft ordinance. Um, I'll try and go through it, um, not in super detail, but give you an overview. The memo uh, kind of covers a lot of those elements, but I'll kind of be brief, but if you need to stop me and ask questions, feel free to do so. Um, so this code is supposed to be simpler. Um, it is simpler but it's longer. Our current code is about 19 pages. This new one will be about 30 some odd pages. But um, as mentioned, it's simpler and it's more defensible. Right now, the sign code, um, there's a lot of opportunities for interpretation and misinterpretation. <clears throat> um, some of the bigger things that have happened in recent years as it relates to Supreme Court cases and those kind of items that we've now adopted into this as well is taking away of what is seen as unconstitutional references so we can't call out political signs anymore or special event signs or real estate signs um, they've just got to be neutral so that'll be the biggest thing in this <coughs> code that when we have discussions that um, we can't talk about the content that's on the sign so that even goes to advertising that you see maybe at gas stations where they're advertising product um, that sent, tend to sit out there for a while, it's all gonna be based off the sign itself. Um, also, it was unclear as far as um, time frames and approvals and review. Um, right now, five business days should cover most applications that, that we receive. Um, so the structural structure of this, I'll kind of go through it. Um, I know you all read it in detail. It was really fun read, I think, for everybody. Um, but I'll kind of go through what, what has changed um, in the order of the ordinance. Uh, the biggest part, the biggest question is uh, to make it easier on everybody is we're going to repeal the entire Chapter 20, Article 9. Instead of cut and paste and keep this and that, we're going to repeal the whole thing. It makes it a little bit easier for Jason, too, that we're not trying to scab all these words and phrases together, even though some of it stayed. Um, we're just going to repeal the whole thing. Um, and then the bigger one at the end is a new one. It's actually uh, in Article 3, which is the procedures of the sign design that it's going to, and we'll talk about this. This is a program alternative that will replace the current variance process that we follow right now um, to hopefully expedite that and also um, be more clear and reserve variances for more this hardship issues and those kind of things versus sign placement. Um, so the structure, as in your code, um, <coughs> as we go as we go through it, um, a lot of it. Uh, section 10 just is policy statements. That's stuff that is more in legal in nature of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, that we have justification behind why we have a sign code. It's basically the, the, the many statements and purposes and intent of this code um, and the findings that we're being content neutral, um, how temporary signs relate, regulations, those kind of items. Uh, section 20, applicability and exemptions. I think that was the biggest section that really got reduced. I think currently our exemptions, when we're talking about political signs and those kind of things, I think it was five pages worth of exemptions. So a lot of that has now gone away because they were all content-based. So a lot of that went away. Section 30 talks about sign districts. Our current code has 
<coughs> sign districts, it's called business and residential. That's it, which seems good <coughs> enough, but what we've run into is areas of town that are B1 that allows for residents and businesses, which one do you follow? So in, in that section, the sign districts, there's actually, there's actually four sections now. One deals with the interstate, so if you have a business within, I believe, a thousand feet of the interstate, you would have a little bit more latitude because we want to have more people that are driving <coughs> through see that advertising and signage. Currently, our code only allows for those properties that are adjacent to I-76. So this will open it up more towards that revenue Ave Riverview, Riverview Avenue corridor by extending that. Um, business, industrial, residential, and agricultural. The sign districts do cover um, which zones apply, and so it's, it'll be a combination that it's a business district, but it would also allow B1 that has residents in there as well. Um, measurements of signs, this is the bigger one right now. We have some vague how to measure a <coughs> sign, what's considered the right size, square footage, height, those kind of things. Um, we've got more cables, so it should be clear it's covered i think every possible known sign that's out there um, that helps mike and myself and the other mike when we're reviewing applications um section 50 <coughs> applicable what's prohibited 60 we won't get into that's illumination um that's going to be like the big message boards or how signs project light at night and section seven is message centers which is your electronic boards that have items on it a lot more. Um, freestanding signs by district. We've clarified those tables. Um, before we had freestanding signs, but that blended pole signs and monument signs. What's the difference? We didn't really know. That was part of the problem. Now it's just all freestanding. And so they're all covered in their own category. And then attached signs, things that you've seen in variances. This is going to cover everything from a projecting sign to a canopy sign to an awning sign to a Fin sign, a fin sign would be like the cover that's sticking out like a fin, um, and that is a term. Um, we'll cover temporary signs, I think that's one of the bigger ones that we had in our code, but there wasn't any form of time frames, how long they could last, how to do fees, what's really temporary, that's all covered, how they need to be maintained, enforce, what we do with non-conforming, and when to remove signs, such as businesses that have been closed for a long time those signs should be removed so that they're always not up there. Um, that's more clear. Even temporary signs, you'll see there's time frames. So they don't sit up there and you don't have a two year grand opening <coughs> sign still up there. <laughs> so we look at those. Uh, the temporary signs will also cover, since we can't cover content, it will cover material type. So those cardboard ones we see around that start flopping, those will have a timeline so they at least stay in good shape. Um, all the way up to vinyl and those kind of items. Um, and then the big one added to Article 3 uh, is called the Sign Design Program Alternative. Um, I won't get super into that, but again, this is hopefully to cover the variance process that even with all these standards in here, we still have to have a program that allows them to come up with something different and within reason. Currently in the proposed ordinance, which is something um, for you guys to think about um, when we presented this to planning commission this would put and staff generally supports it but it's up to you to put that on planning commission so we're not going through that variance process um, with you guys um, that's what's in the code ordinance right now that those sign program alternatives or alterations to the code would go through planning commission for review and it could be for approval or it could be for recommendation New districts, we talked about that again, interstate interchange, business, industrial, residential, and agricultural. Um, approach to non-residential, um, as we talked about, right now we only allow three types of signs. So you can't have a pole sign, a wall sign, and a projecting sign. That's just what you could do. We got rid of that. It shouldn't really matter in our mind. So uh, that's gone away. And then the square signage area was always 300 square feet. So you could have all these different combinations. We'll use Taco Bell as an example. All the bells and murals and everything 
altogether can't equal more than 300 square feet. That's generally kind of gone away and the new code, which also helps with redevelopment, is gonna be more site specific as it relates to the context of the building. So now our code is gonna be more of a square footage based off of the lot frontage. So if you have 200 foot long lot, you could have more signage versus right now, 300 square foot, we could have a little tiny building and the whole thing is a sign. It's kind of out of scale, right? <laughs> so a lot of that, and it helps us from a code enforcement standpoint too, that we're kind of doing architectural elements, but you know we're also still following that code, but that way it's gonna help us, especially on these redevelopment cases, um, as economic development keeps getting more people and redevelopment and buildings to keep the sprawl really from happening that's gonna hopefully cover and let them put in better things. I think that's the bulk of the variances you've seen, is those that wanna refinish their building or a new business that need a new sign, and we're hoping to accomplish that by this new portion of the code. The other one is we got rid of the setback, all the various setback requirements. In general, it's two foot regardless. Um, I think as we've talked about before, some cases it's 25 feet, some it's equal to the building, some it's zero, really, if we do the two feet, I think we're gonna cover every possible sign that's already in the city. And they'll all actually be conforming. The majority of them would be with the new code, which is what we're also trying to accomplish. This new code makes the city more compliant than currently it's non-compliant with the code. Um, but there still would be the overriding, obviously, if there's visualization or safety issues, that setback may have to be more. So if it's on an intersection, those kind of things. But generally, a lot of those freestanding signs, they're already right, right behind the property lines. So. There's an example of what we have right now. This is, they have a wall sign and then two wall signs and then a big tall pole sign and they just can't exceed 300 square feet proposed code you're basically looking at one square foot for linear footage um, doesn't care which sign you're using and then this one changed a little bit of the height of the sign which goes back to in the interstate area we want it higher we want to bring people to us but when we get in other areas of town someone to have a 40 foot sign in the middle of downtown <laughs> is really out of context with the building Temporary signs, that's um, a good one and an interesting one. Again, it classifies and regulates temporary signs based on what they say, not what they are. And that's the one thing that we have to get rid of. So that was a total overhaul. Um, so basically what happens is, as Jason's put it in other meetings, if a homeowner wants to put a sign that meets the criteria, they can say they love Halloween if they want, or they can make it a real estate. We can't look at content anymore. Um, the proposed code classifies and regulates on what they are, which means their structure and materials like we talked about. So the yard signs that you see would have certain time frames, not what's on it, but how many times they can be placed there. Your banners that you see around town, uh, swing signs, we don't have a lot of those. They're kind of like the A-frame ones, but they swing in the middle. Um, sight signs, and then like we talked about, there's, um, then you've got the, the flutter signs or the teardrop ones that we talk about, those kind of elements. Those would all generally follow under the temporary sign requirements. Um, so what we've covered in this one, um, which may require a little bit more discussion, we can follow up. Um, the current code kind of talks about the display, especially like special events, which is very hard and kind of vague to, um, to some degree on what's really considered a special event, you know, um, whether it's a grand opening or whether it's someone wanting to have a downtown grand opening. We don't really know what the special event is. It's all mixed in with carnivals and everything. The proposed one um, is based off the materials and maintenance, uh, and you'd remove the sign upon the first to occur. Where that's all detailed out is, where it gets kind of long, would be in your ordinance uh, about page, <coughs> I'll just tell you, be paid starting on page 18. Um, and that talks about, again, the sign districts your sight signs, your swing signs, your sidewalk signs, your yard signs, we've covered every possible sign, so we don't have to interpret 
banners, feather flags, and then just your standard flags. Um, it talks about the standards and again, it establishes timelines. So on page 23, it talks about depending on the material. So if it's paper and card stock, you can't use a sidewalk sign or a banner sign because it's the first rain it's gonna fall apart, right? Um, however, as you get better into the woods or the metal or the vinyl, then more days are allowable, which again, it kind of goes back to what's, what's a normal duration for those. So for example, banner signs that we see around town, um, those would be allowed for 30 days if they're made of cloth or canvas, which they usually are. Um, they'd be allowed, that banner sign be allowable for 30 days. And then what we've thrown in right now is you can only do 120 days worth, which basically means you'd have to be doing, you can only do it four months. You wouldn't be able to have one up every month of the year. That's one of those we've got to decide what we want. There are certain businesses, that's part of their business, right? Is it every month is a different sale, those kind of things. So that's what we may have to look at further on what seems to be reasonable. Um, window signs we're less worried about. Those would be just the sale and the sign. Uh, we're hoping not to really do a whole lot of sign permitting on those. Um, they don't really affect a whole lot. Sidewalk signs are pretty straightforward. They're just open during business hours. Uh, yard signs, those are usually for special activities that we can't define anymore, that depending on the materials be 45 days, 60 days, or 180 days. And again, if it falls apart, we have better enforcement and more teeth to go and have them removed and replaced, which right now it's kind of on a, on a um, premise and not fully defined in the current code. So next steps. Um, <coughs> going through the review and comment. Staff is reviewing this right now, looking at some of the logistics in, in the ordinance right now. There's some typos where it talks about three districts, even though there's four. There's some timelines we're verifying. Um, one of the bigger items, I think, um, from you guys would be um, the allowance of planning commission doing the alternative. Um, it's a good plan. We don't expect it to be used a lot, but it also allows for items like, for example, our industrial park. We have that big entry sign that has all the different names, and then they would have regulations inside, or a Walmart would be similar to that. I think over by the Dollar General, they have that big Times Square sign that has Dollar General and the left, left, rest are empty. Those would fall probably more under that, that alternative where they're setting it up so you're not necessarily looking at every single property to do their own thing, that it's to see it as kind of like a signed PUD, I guess, so that way we're not dealing with every business on a unique nature. If a developer comes in and wants to subdivide, so wants to keep a common theme, it could happen to residential housing areas, you know, if someone wants to create a gated something, that way it's consistent throughout, so. So another, another way to state that is once that district is created, if you will, um, all of the signs that are then taken afterwards don't need to come back for their own additional approval through the variance process. It's just this is what's allowed for that particular property, whether it's a strip mall or a neighborhood or industrial park, et cetera. This is what's approved, and then all the signs that fit within that original approval, whether or not they currently exist, they can be put in later without having to go through an additional process. So they step whatever standard they want. So, or if we miss something in there, it'll cover this as well. Um, so we did. I did a similar presentation with the planning commission. Um, we did have the discussion. They were generally didn't have a problem um, overseeing this alternative process. Obviously, it's up to you as council. Um, we can talk about it further. We still will need to go through the ordinance process through the end of the year. Um, so we're kind of at the point now. If, want to, now that you've had your overview, offer any comments or questions. We may have to go through another iteration. If there are specific <laughs> items you want us to look at in detail, we can do that. Um, and then we can always take it back to Planning Commission, but at some point, per our grant, we'll have to have it wrapped up by the end of the year. So it's just a lot to digest. So I thought I'd give you an <coughs> overview of how like everything has changed on its end. So. But hopefully it's easier for staff for people when they come in that we have a definitive place that we can 
look at from a code. So with the banner signs, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you said they can only have them up four months. That's what about, what's in the ordinance right now. What's about what about some of the auto dealerships and that that change them out and put them up regularly? They can only do those four months, or is there a provision in there for them? Um, to run more than that, or is that what they would be a lot set to do? Is just and that's and that's what we look at the temporary, and that's what we want to kind of look at. That you know, there's two ways we can leave it at the 120, which is only the four months. We're not too worried about it, and we know people are rotating it, and we want to keep it on the 30 day, a new one every 30 day cycle, and it just happens throughout the year. I think we're fine with that. It's kind of your call if we want to change those. One swing. There's no. There's no reason behind those dates. It's, <coughs> that's what when we were working with the legal group. That's what they've seen in other communities. So, but to your point, what we can't do is say, if it's a car dealership and you're doing this, then you get different times because this will apply to any banner winner in the city. So the balance you want to take, and um, when determining what that total amount of days is, is. How does it affect some people or some businesses that we already know, but what are also the the opposite ends of the extreme that we might not necessarily want to see and kind of find that middle ground? But you're putting a time frame on it, though, because they don't want it looking ratty. Is that correct? But and that's that initial on the material. Right. That's that we're, we're pretty comfortable with those time frames based off of material. Obviously, when it's paper and those kind of things, those aren't going to last. We want at least a little bit better quality type of material if it's going to go out there. Um, but as far as how often you want to see it, you know, that's kind of up to you guys because it's going to apply throughout. It, again, just goes back to if we apply it to one, it's going to apply them to everything. So when we talk about yard signs, since we can't talk about since we can't talk about political signs and the and the special events and all those. We've got to be cognizant of is that going to preclude one of those as we see them in Fort Morgan? They tend to happen in yards. We have lots of things that go on that we're going to preclude someone from being able to put up one could, of those at some point. Could we put it as like the um, condition of this line? You know, um, like you said, the uh, but it, instead of a time frame, have it be more just. I think that's what he's alluding to. And we to can. If we don't want to say that, hey, you can only have banner signs, you pick what four months. So we where just does want this... to do it purely off of off of the material type that you have to replace it within certain time frames or if they get bad prior to that. So wouldn't the commercial districts mm -hmm. you're talking about setting up districts, mm -hmm. isn't the commercial districts going to be separate from residential districts or that? So I mean, isn't there segregation between the usage of these in in the various districts that you're proposing or am i the type of temporary sign is already kind of defined by the districts not not the time frames so for example um if we look at we'll just well let's just use banners as an example um Banners is in a, in a temporary standpoint. Again, this goes back to if you're going to have a banner, it's got to be mounted on a wall, a fence, a screen wall. Mounting hardware shall be concealed from view. This is going to apply in every district other than ag. Um, banner shall be stretched tightly to avoid movements. And it shall, it's not allowed if a feather flag, an electronic message board, or yard sign is displayed on the property. So now people are having to pick, right? If we want to go that direction so you don't have a property that has Fluttered. the banner, the feather things, that's where we kind of decide is that getting too much? And then you have the swan sandwich boards, those kind of things. That's kind of that balance. So that's how this is defined. But for the most part, the spacing, if you're in the area by the interstate, you can space them four feet apart. But when you're in the residential, they can be two foot. But it also says the max number in the business is one per hundred feet of frontage. But single family, duplex, townhome, <laughs> residential uses, banners are not allowed. <coughs> so we're already kind of like you're talking about, we're creating who can use them where. 
And then there's the next layer of how long do we want to leave them. And so we're not worried about how long they are as long as they're getting rotated out in a regular manner. I think we're okay with that. Then we want to look at what's allowable where. So again, yard signs are probably going to be wanted and needed in residential areas, but big old banner probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that's where the districts come. With the, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, with the existing <coughs> signs that, how do I want to word this? Do we see any current issues with the proposed code with signs that are already in place? Um, I think specifically like Business Mart, just put up a banner type sign where um, it would have probably fallen before under a painted marquee, I think is what it's considered in here. Are we pro? I guess, I guess. Are we prohibiting anything that is already up there? And um, let me see the best way to put this. <laughs> There's a lot of signs that are going up that are in the gray area right now. <laughs> that may or may not need a permit and may or may not need to be enforced because the code is very vague. So. W our current code, if we talk about a canvas going up down in that area versus a hard solid one, our code right now is silent on the material. So as long as it meets like the 300 square foot max standpoint, then it would be fine. Now, whether they went in and asked if they needed a sign permit to put it up so that we could evaluate it with the other signs that's on the building, I personally don't know that business if they did or didn't. Most people do a good job of coming in, but those are the ones when we find a sign maybe going up because like we've talked about before, some of those are more structurally, that falls under our building code. We've got to look at the structural elements and the electrical elements and those kind of things to make sure it doesn't hinder the public and safety. Now, whether it's a canvas one, you know, sometimes we'd say, nah, we're not worried about it. Some people will say, hey, we want it as a special event while we're waiting for the new sign to get ordered. Well, there's cases in town that that was a year ago. And so this will help cover some of those elements and some of them I think become those that are maybe having some wear and tear that need to be addressed. And so I don't see anybody being worse off. I think this helps us understand what we've got so we're not picking it based off of this business or this complaint that it's uniform right. and being consistent right. with everybody. And that's. That's why that linear footage, I think pretty much when we did the evaluation and we walked the streets and all that kind of stuff, for the most part, everyone's done a sign within the scale of their building. And that's why hopefully that puts everybody, it's just that how we want to deal with those temporary signs. <clears throat> Our current code right now um, doesn't allow the teardrop signs. Um, it doesn't allow dancing men doesn't allow flag streamers from light poles to other places. Um, and that's been in place since 2010. But there's nothing in there that allows them an option to do that. And that's what this is doing, that if you want to, there's that alternative, so. We covered the dancing men in here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's not called that, but it would fit in there, right? That was, wasn't it? Was it flying? That could something. be. I think we took out the barber pole. That's in our current code. The barber poles are allowed. Um, but to your point and to Brad's comment earlier, as far as the maximum days, that's up to the city council to set what standard we want as a community. If we want multiple um, temporary signs out year round, or if if somebody has a year round sign, perhaps they should just put in a permanent sign that they can then change the lettering on something that's a little bit more substantive rather than other options. But that basically that goes down to what is the tastes of the community, a mountain community. Uh, ski town might have a completely different ideal as to what's tolerable to their <coughs> local populace, as to what's tolerable to Denver, what's tolerable here, et cetera. So those are um, currently in the ordinance. As the draft is what's kind of in the middle ground, but certainly council can change that one way or the other. If you don't want to have temporary signs more than 30 days for a whole year, that's your prerogative as council. Um, <clears throat> if you want to allow temporary signs all year round with no limit, that's prerogative of the council and 
and the community. Yeah, the temporary signs has been the most difficult one to interpret in our code because we talk about they're needed, but it doesn't talk about the process of getting a permit when they go down. They say 30 days, but that's, but like I say, you can't have them, current code, you can't have them on permanent framing or fixtures because then it's seen as permanent. And so that's when people want to rotate them and if they want to come in every 30 days and pay another $25 for another 30 days, well, now is that becoming more of a regular? So this hopefully clarifies how to do that because everyone's got a different way of dealing with it. So and then obviously anything that goes in the right of way would have to go through a vocable right of way process. Anything on state highway would be disallowed. So a lot of that stuff is further clarified anyways um, that we can't have those in the public rights of way. So I'm thinking of some of the recent signed variances that we have approved. Um, it all seemed pretty reasonable, um, what we've approved in the past. Does this new code, I mean, do you anticipate less signed variances coming our way because of this new code or? Absolutely. What we found in most of the variances we've seen was the setback issue. Um, B1, when the zoning changed in 2010, it said the average of adjoining lots is the building setback, which basically meant the building. Well, that was the biggest issue when people wanted to sign out towards the street. And that's why most of those variances you see in that B1, because it wasn't a hard and fast 10 feet, 5 feet, 25 feet. There was too much linking the sign code to our zoning portion of the code. And that's what we're trying to eliminate is we're creating our own little hybrid districts where it's combining all these different zones together. And I believe the majority of all these signs require a two foot setback or within reason if there's public safety issues or intersections, those kind of things that they take precedence on vision clearance. So the ones that you've seen, um, those wouldn't have come here because they were all setback issues, especially along Platte Avenue. They were all setback issues everyone beyond that and that's where the 300 foot most people don't ever come anywhere near 300 foot anyway so when are you looking at <clears throat> having this go to the ordinance process here shortly Every, or comfortable with all your questions and we hopefully answer them all <laughs> after <Okay>. election season <laughs> <laughs> I think we had tentatively, depending on what your position was um, here, um, we would go back to planning commission, follow up. I mean, if that's a general direction that you're okay with that, because um, I think that that's kind of a twofold. If you want to have them have that authority, that's one item. But if you need more information on what we're doing in these, such as the time frames, we're fine with. The material and not having an ultimate only so many times we can do that down the road it doesn't seem to work and it's becoming problematic always change it so, but i think this it's a lot of information but mike and i've gone through it in almost all the cases that we've looked at it's like how it would affect this building or mcdonald's or this one or that one or even when we look at walmart they're well, well beyond 300 square feet you know those kind of things and so it's just but it fits within the context of the building and that's what we start running into especially you have that property or maybe you mentioned car dealerships that may have two or three entrances and they're covering a 300 foot area to just say you can only have one sign facing the street does that make sense when they have multiple entrances and that's where a lot of those things we've evaluated that let's make more sense of really how it relates to the existing structures and the existing roads and not just new development. New development's easy because you just tell them this is all you can do and they go do it. It's these redevelopment and re-ownerships and things <coughs> like that that we tend to, they're trying to clean up some of this old stuff and that's what we run into, so. Question of, because I said in just after election season, um, while we can't speak to the content of uh -huh. the signs, Speaking to the content of, say, political signs, mm -hmm. um, we have a vast array of signs. Are we saying that, so that would constitute the little <coughs> corrugated ones, those are yard signs, correct? Mm -hmm. So does 60 days 
play into what we normally have for like our election? Well, I think there are separate requirements for political candidate signs for city council in our election code. And I don't know if you guys- Yeah, but not anymore. And that's for the sign code. So okay. we don't, we can't address what's on the sign anymore. So what that goes to is what you're saying is again, if we don't want to have max delay design times in here, when you see the big wood ones that people put up, that actually allows, and we want to call that a yard sign made of wood or metal. It's good for 180 days. Right. Would, but, but when you get into, yeah, if you're getting into the card stock, those kind of things, um, 45 days is for the laminated paper. And I just don't know if, I guess I, my concern would be, I, I would hope we look at that, we're looking at that in terms of what's um, practical for not looking at the content of the sign, but you all, I mean, we have um, candidates currently that are running for um, commissioner. Those signs have been up since forever. Absolutely. You know, how, obviously that's not gonna fit within this. And that's what makes this difficult because at the same time, would you want, we're gonna talk content, do you wanna relate to life signs still up now, even if it's past? I'd rather have that than the. But that, but that's <laughs> right. But, that, but that's, but Sorry. that's kind of what we're running. And that's, you know, again, it goes back to so some of those that we've had in the past, where you have the the hail companies come in and they're all over the place, and then they never come back later and pick them up. Um, sure. There's always the the special events or church events or youth sports sign up nows, all those, and that's why, unfortunately, yeah, we can't. It's hard. You want to do content, and that's what makes it very difficult. Right. On because if we're going to do that, then just be aware that someone has the right to say "Happy Halloween" year-round on their yard sign, or for six months, or whatever they want. Yeah. I, I just, we don't want to. We don't want to. Absolutely. Hinder the political process, you know. But we also don't want to have you know political signs mm -hmm. or you know. And we don't want to make it any more costly for people that are used to doing it when you have those agencies that go and buy those signs on the lesser that, again, are intended for short term versus long term. But yeah. Yeah, I just don't know what that, that time frame. I think that's something we have to seriously, because to me, 60 days is probably not an adequate amount of time for a yard sign in certain circumstances. And that's the killer right there, right? unless we change that to a zoning and we look at yard signs in residential versus in business, that's really the only way we can change those, what's allowed and what's not. But again, it's important to look at the two extremes of we want to allow people the opportunity to express their support or disdain for whatever candidate or, or ballot issue, et cetera. Or, or Halloween. But at the same token, <laughs> that will apply to every single thing. So if we want to put up, and you could imagine what this, the town would look like if we allowed um, for six months on a sign, for instance, and then every single yard could have a sign for any purpose whatsoever. So you could have a, the great debate about which hot dog is the best here in Fort Morgan. You could have the, the debate about uh, uh, whether or not we should eat canned tuna. It could all be all over the signs all year round. And that's kind of the, you know, the absurdity of it all. And finding that balance is luckily your job, not mine. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. <laughs> but you're here to keep us out of trouble. <laughs> and does a yard sign have to be in the yard? Or is that just the concept of, so for example, if you were to drive on Platte Avenue, we have yard signs that are attached to fences. Does that still make it a yard sign? That would be a different sign. I don't know what <laughs> it is. Even though it's still one of those that could be stuck into the yard with the little. I think, I, yeah. And I don't mean to be difficult. I'm just no, it's already fine. And I think, I think that one's called a <clears throat> site sign, I think, because it's attached to the wall, but it's not quite a banner. So the yard sign is the one that you're putting in the ground in your yard. The site one would be that it's posted on a fence or something like that, if I remember so right. Does that, so does that buy it them more the time? It the same parameters right <laughs> now. I mean, it's the same as other than um, 
a lot. Those stronger. you can only use two material types instead of three, like the yard sign. Just food for site home. signs, site signs. Yeah. Maximum area is 32 square feet. Um, if we look in residential areas, one per 500 mm -hmm. linear foot of frontage or a fraction thereof. Um, provided that the property is at least one acre, properties that are less than one acre should not display the site signs. So those are intended to be signs maximum six foot high and 32 square foot. In residential, they can be 16 square feet. So four by four. And, so and to that specific question, if you look at the definitions under site sign, it means any type of temporary sign that is constructed of vinyl, plastic, wood, metal, or other com comparable rigid material, which is displayed on a structure that includes at least two posts. I mean, it's rear wall, retaining wall. Yep. So, so would that particular house on Platte Avenue be in compliance with this new code? Because there are currently, say, hypothetically speaking, mm -hmm. there are four political signs. Of, or, or four happy Halloween signs, we'll go with that. Is that still within? Well, depending on how long they got put up. Mm. More than 60 days. Well, right, right now, depending <laughs> on the material, it's either 60 or 180. Just, just, just. But if it falls under that residential, <clears throat> so if it's on plat, see, that's, that's the difference. So if it's on plat, then that would fall under the business industrial. Even though, Zoning, even though it's even a though house? It's resident, right. So when you look at your industrial, <laughs> right, that's how we cover those residents. Awesome. So then we look at BI, which allows one per 500 linear square feet of frontage or fraction thereof, max sign area is 32 square feet. So if there's several, depends on how many they have. If they're all four by four, but if they're two by two, you could have a couple of them. And as long as they're not over six foot high, and it states two foot from the front and street side of the property lines and 10 feet from all other property lines. Minimum spacing between buildings is six feet. So. And you know, and to, to be fair, you know, this is precedence that was set for 20 or 30 years in the way the signed codes were interpreted. And whilst the Supreme Court last June didn't overturn the law, they <coughs> certainly turned it on its head. And now this is kind of the way it works. Um, so it, there might be some heartburn on how this is implemented, but the reality is this isn't just here, it's nationwide, and uh, giving it some time, I think the populace will adjust. We don't really have a choice to some degree. And I think that's, I think that's a key, once this is rolled out, is explaining specifically for content, um, that we're explaining very clearly that, you know, we're not just saying you can't do this. It's, you know, it's coming from a higher power. So yeah, there'll be some adjustments, but that's where you can be as flexible as possible. You say, but the con with, they exclude the content part, it's very difficult <laughs> <coughs> when you're trying to compare different pieces. So, so once again, what was your time frame on um, wanting I to bring think, back an ordinance? Um, <clears throat> I think we had tentatively that it would go back to Planning Commission next Monday for their general recommendation and approval, and then whatever the earliest for posting for ordinances and those who require would come back to City Council. So first or second meeting? Well, probably be a second meeting in Probably be second October. in October, yeah. I can't remember. Do we have to do an announcement to make a motion to make it? For the first reading or are we just doing no there'd be a resolution on first reading okay and then we'd have the public hearing at a later date which would be the presumably the first meeting in november so the resolution could be october <laughs> 4th so we still have a little bit of time to, to kind of digest this and mm -hmm. and that before it, yep it, and then we would in this ordinance <clears throat> we wouldn't recommend or would we just have it effective starting january 1st and it would be effective as other ordinances within five days okay. or after five days after it's passed and published. Because yeah. uh, the reality is our sign code as it sits right now is not um, compliant with the Supreme Court. So we're not enforcing many aspects of the sign code as it sits so that we're not getting into any hot water. Uh, that said, the sooner we can get it resolved, the better, but we do want to do it in a way that makes sense and is 
taking out as many issues at the front end, comments, concerns on time frames, et cetera, rather than continually adjusting it over the next several months. Sure. <coughs> okay. Anybody else have any questions for Brad? I guess we have a week or two to digest this, and if we have any changes, we need to give them direction. I guess one thing we probably look, should look at is whether we want planning commission to have authorization to approve or a recommendation and bring it back to council, which they currently are the ones that approve the the comprehensive plans when mm -hmm. we we do them. So. Any thoughts on that? So they would make recommendations about the plan that Brad presented right now? They would, if there's any variance or that would, that would come with the signs that would go to the planning commission, they would review <coughs> it, approve it or deny it, and that would be where it would go. It would never come to us. Or do we want them to review it, make an advisory type of recommendation, bring it back to council and we make that determination. Page 30 is where the approval criteria is stated. Um, planning commission may approve a sign design program or alternative if it finds the sign design program results in substantially improved comprehensive and unified proposal following the code. So they would be the ones vetting all the things if it's not per the code. So it can be approval, it can be recommendation, it could be keep going to you guys, that's my Do personal it. opinion. I let them review it once we've made our determination on this, turn it into an ordinance. They can review any variances that may come up. I mean, we've already set standards on here. There's no need to send it and rehash it a couple of times. Majority of the time in my tenure it we went with their recommendations um, so I, that's my personal opinion and, and thoughts and they'd always have the option if they you know I mean even if we give them the authority to approve they always have the option if they're not comfortable correct with that they could bring that before council not <clears throat> not the way it's currently written they, <clears throat> all or nothing they, right they, yep so it, <clears throat> with this new code, we would be dealing with sign variations much less frequently. It would have to be something truly unique for it to come to us. Mm -hmm. um, so a truly unique outlier situation, do we want to give up that authority to someone else? We've set the standard so you know we don't we review the comprehensive plan which is a much more intensive tool that we utilize they do the final approval of it not the council so I mean to me it's basically the same thing we have a competent uh, core of individuals that run and oversee the planning commission which they're they're not an advisory board <coughs> they are a appointed commission by this council. So, my, like I said, my personal opinion or belief is, yeah, I don't see this being a problem be seeing that once we get this lined out and revised. I guess it would be the same thing as liquor licensing, allowing the, Mr. Brennan to approve that if there's no extenuating circumstances or for renewals and that. I mean, that's pretty, pretty similar. Would violations then come in front of us? Kind of like, I mean, I guess using that same analogy of liquor licensing where, you know, we, we delegated that authority. Um, if there was a violation, I guess that would. We're be, we are still the board of adjustments mm -hmm. or the. So if it fell without outside the parameters, parameters all those then alternatives. It would come back to us. But preliminary authorization, if it meets the criteria, for the most part, yes, it comes back. So, I mean, that's. Yes, yeah, so I think, and to me, that, that makes the difference to me is, because is, ultimately, I think we have to be responsible. Mm -hmm. 
for regardless of whether it's the planning commissioner that approves it, we ultimately have to be responsible if it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think if you know we're still that you know board of adjustments, then I would agree with what you're saying. I think it you know we don't need all these you know onesie twosie offshoots to come in front of council when we have a perfectly well balanced planning commission that's qualified to do that. Now there is a, not to throw a wrench or something different, um, <coughs> also in there the duration of the approval with the program, it does have a term of three years to go in effect. Um, and that deals more with when we're talking about new development that may come to you because if they want it part of a larger development scheme, so if it's tied to a development agreement or something like that, that one would probably be both parties involved. But on some of these other ones where it's the offshoots potentially in those versus the larger master plans. But those bigger ones, everyone's going to see it anyways because that's the major subdivision process, the minor subdivision process, um, all those other condition zonings that would all come out at the same time. And we would just be able to make sure we're cognizant if they want to do special signage to probably <coughs> include that through, through that process as well. So and that would come before on. us regardless. <laughs> We're all looking at Dan. <laughs> I'm all right. Okay. I'm, I'm okay with it. Does anybody Going have any quick further questions or comments for Mr. Curtis or our esteemed attorney? <clears throat> Just, <clears throat> excuse me, to make sure I'm on the same page as to what it is you're wanting. Um, because the way this is currently worded, the way I understand it, Planning Commission has the authority over the sign code variances if you will it's not called a variance but that's what more or less what it is as far as the one-off situations where you have a violation <clears throat> that would be handled through an enforcement mechanism by the city manager or designee not necessarily something that would come back to council so i mean it's different than the liquor licensing authority which has a lot of state statutes that govern that it goes to the liquor board on an annual basis and those types of things. A sign, once it's in there, it's, it's there, um, unless it's temporary, right? And then <clears throat> if there's violations, it would be an enforcement issue, not necessarily whether or not they're allowed to get new signs. It's just a matter of us going and enforcing the code to remove a non-complying sign, uh, potentially cite somebody into municipal court if they aren't working with us um, it would be completely separate enforcement I just want to make sure it's clear what council is expecting as opposed to what it is now and if you want any changes <clears throat> but it, if I understand correctly it's just give it to this um, planning commission and okay yeah. <laughs> then it's Jeff's problem I'm good with that <laughs> <laughs> and then were you guys going to kind of think more about the temporary, temporary. timeline thing some more We'll bring it up to them. I would put say it in the pursue it if we get any community feedback or yeah. after reading this, we have any questions or input. I would say individually as council, we would get a hold of Jeff and let okay. him know. Um, so it, it, I will be fine with that just to proceed with the way to give them the direction they have. If you have any comments or public input, bring it to Mr. Wells' attention and we'll, we'll keep working fun. through the staff comments and those kind of items there you too, go. so it'll be cleaner and then we'll take it to planning commission just need to we need to talk to them a little bit further on ramifications of those things so we have okay. some more options available for you okay thank you very much for your time thanks Brad <coughs> good with that <coughs> Uh, next, we have a presentation and <clears throat> on the development of our stormwater utility. Mr. Wells, Mr. Curtis, and Ms. Kenny. Thank you very much, Your Honor. We're, we are continuing to work, as Council's directed us, to develop a stormwater utility in the sewer fund. And we have come back with uh, some more information and may need some additional direction uh, on how you would like us to proceed. Uh, I provided some background in the memo on what's gone on. Uh, this has been out there for a long time. And um, there are a lot of really good reasons uh, to move forward with the uh, stormwater utility. Uh, there are environmental issues that are coming up 
uh, EPA is regulating it more and more. Uh, right now, all of the stormwater development comes out of the general fund. Uh, so that generally takes away from streets projects uh, to do stormwater projects. And I think a lot of people sometimes think that we haven't been doing anything. We've, we've been doing projects almost every year. Uh, some very good award-winning projects actually have come out of uh, the uh, Public Works Department in developing stormwater drainage projects throughout the city. Some of the most recent ones are uh, at Optimus Park, uh, South Sherman. Uh, we did some vaults <coughs> to, uh, as part of a master plan uh, development or improvement over on 8th and Ensign. So you, we, we continue to do this a little bit at a time. So it's not like we're not doing anything. Um, some of the things that we want to talk about tonight, and I'll talk about a few, and then I'm going to have uh, Brad and Jeannie talk about a couple of things. Uh, the first issue that we want to talk about is how do you want to go about doing these projects? Um, there are two sides of what we're trying to accomplish. The first one is operations and maintenance, uh, which is going on right now. It's being uh, funded by the general fund operating uh, account. Uh, the capital items are all being paid out of the general fund capital items. <coughs> so. What we've been doing historically is we find a project, uh, we save up money, we go out and we try and get a grant. Uh, the last grant that we got helped us do about a million dollar project on South Sherman. Uh, when we got that grant, we were told by Department of Local Affairs that that would be our last grant uh, from them until we did have a stormwater fee in place. The, the rationale is if a community is not willing to help themselves, why would we be willing to help them? So the idea is they want to see a dedicated fee that's being raised for the purpose of developing these projects. If we do that, we'll be eligible again for additional grant funds. So traditionally what we've done is saved up our money, gone to a granting agency, asked for the money, we go out and we do the project. Um, that is a process that we can continue to do now. Uh, we can raise money with the fee, put it into a capital account, uh, save it up, and then uh, have matching funds for uh, various projects that we want to do down the road. Another option that we have is to take the f uh, fees and uh, go out and bond projects where we want to get a big project done right away, so we want to go spend the money and get it done and then we pay it over a period of time. Uh, traditionally, the city of Fort Morgan has been uh, pay as you have the money. Uh, it's interesting because most communities outside of the state of Colorado who aren't subject to TABOR consider pay as you go as going out and getting a bond. Uh, we consider pay as you go, go out as you and spend it as you get the money. So uh, the first thing I, I'd like to get some feedback from council on is how would you like to proceed with this? Um, I, I want Jeannie to come up and talk a little bit about bond costs. In your packet you'll find kind of a, an amortization schedule. We just put in a number. Uh, well, it's not just any number. There's about $10 million worth of capital projects that we already have uh, preliminary engineering done for done on and uh, those um, projects could be bonded uh, but Jeannie put together kind of this uh, amortization schedule to, to tell you a little bit about and I'll let her go over that with you a uh, little bit about what it would cost if we were to go out and bond uh, the projects that have currently been engineered and that doesn't include operation and maintenance that doesn't include the other side. So this is just if we were to bond some of these projects and get them done right away. So Jeannie. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, the, the sheet that you have in your packet is just simply looking at $10 million borrowed over a period of 20 years with payments twice a year. With an interest rate of 4.5%, we could probably get a lower interest rate than that right now, but we don't know for sure. It's looking at <coughs> maybe more of a worst case scenario. Um, if, you, if you look at um, the total amount of interest paid is five million two hundred seventy thousand. So the total payments are fifteen million, and so um, we'd be borrowing ten million and paying half that much for the financing. It could be that it's less. I mean, if you looked at um, interest rate of maybe um, you know twenty five percent less than that, the interest piece of that would go down. You know, instead of being five point two, it would probably go down like one point two, maybe be more like four million. Um, so, but it is, like Jeff said, unusual for our city to uh, go out and borrow that kind of money. We usually try and uh, pay as we go. 
if you look at what the payments would be each year, the payments would be $763,000. So um, three quarters of a million dollars to pay the debt is something that could maybe be used towards the um, matching funds for us to do a project a year type thing instead of everything all at once. The, uh, um, the other thing, uh, we did talk about um, the costs for, and Bradley, Brad might be talking about this too, I don't want to duplicate, but we're um, probably going to need about $300,000 for operations. And those are mostly monies that are transferred from what is the streets department now. It would be um, two people, and it would be the 40% of our supervisor, JW, and um, moving their salaries over and then moving the associated expenses over <coughs> into this new stormwater fund. Um, the stormwater fees um, may or may not cover that amount, depending upon how much we decide that they should be. There would also be a possibility of moving some money into the sewer fund based on the, no, the amount of revenues we have, because Tabor allows us to move 9.9%. So we could move maybe $180,000 in um, from borrowing, not borrowing, a gift from the general fund. We could do that. <laughs> so, Because um, <laughs> if we borrow, we have to pay it back, and then that's just a whole other issue. So I don't know, is that kind of what you yeah, were Yeah, thinking, that's, that's Jeff? perfect, Jeannie. And so yeah. if you think about it, um, if we did $10 million in projects and, and continued with the standard o operation and maintenance, we'd have to raise a million dollars. That's relevant uh, from the perspective of giving you a, a concept of that's what you could do. Uh, or you could do something less, or you could do something more. There's kind of a sliding scale and, and understanding. Now, what we want direction on is, um, do you want us to continue, uh, and this may come now, it may come later, it's, I'll, we'll leave it up to you to kind of decide, uh, don't necessarily need it right now, but uh, do we continue to do what we've done, <coughs> which is put in place uh, the fee. The fee initially would go towards capital projects. We would save that up year over year, and when a project came up and we could do matching funds with maybe a CDOT project, or DOLA, we would use that money then to do those bigger projects. Meanwhile, we would make transfers out of the general fund into that fund, uh, subject to Tabor limitations, and continue to pay for the uh, operation and maintenance that's being done by the uh, streets department. One of the things for those who are new on council, one of the big <coughs> concerns by the ad hoc committee that looked at this was that we don't want another utility with another truck with a different sign on it. We don't want to duplicate things uh, where we don't have to. So the idea is we start out uh, this way, using what our current resources are, focusing on capital projects, pay as you go. The other alternative is to go out and bond and come up with that and, and do the projects even faster. Uh, it, it, yes, so any questions on that? Yeah, I'm wondering if you can speak to rising costs over time. Uh, I, I know that in a, it's an extra $5 million over the, the 20 years, but if we stagger our projects, pay as you go, costs go up every year, is that going to equate to the same thing? I mean, is that really going to make a difference in the end? Um, I, I think it just depends on the year. <laughs> uh, for example, when we did the, when we did the downtown project, um, we got a really good deal on that because the economy was down and the, everybody wanted work at the time, so we got a still of a deal. I, I think you're gambling with uh, the business cycle. Um, right now, uh, everybody's busy, so it's hard to find people even to put in sidewalks, <laughs> you know, simple <laughs> sidewalks. Uh, so I, I think it just depends on when you time these projects and, and what's happening. So I think it's kind of speculative to say what, what are the actual increases. I guess we could go back and look at data and say how much have uh, capital improvement projects cost increase has been over the last 10 years and, and get an average and say, here's what the average is and do, do a real analysis of that. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of a moving target because it depends on the timing of when you do the project and where the business cycle is and, and how hungry contractors are at the time. But we could do that analysis and uh, bring that back as well to give you an idea. Does it make more sense to uh, spend the money now and pay the interest? and avoid future costs, and I guess we could probably put something together. I think that's a really good question. And the other variable to consider with that is if you do all <laughs> of the projects at once, the $10 million or very quickly, you may be foregoing the opportunity for matching grants over that same time frame. What matching grants will be available 
it's near impossible to say because that's all subject to the state's annual budget, which changes drastically on a regular right. basis. So, you know, there are a lot of variables, and it's kind of speculative on what works best. What we know has worked for the city of Fort Morgan so far is we do projects that we can afford at the time we can afford it. And uh, right now, one of the competing interests that we have are streets. Um, streets need fixed. Streets need improved. Right now, we're taking our capital money and our operation maintenance money, and we're putting that into uh, stormwater. And... You know, many communities have a separate stormwater fund and stormwater fee. Brush is a good example. And just down this road, they have a stormwater fee that is directly related to uh, addressing stormwater issues. Putting in this fee would, would allow us additional revenue to focus on taking care of those issues that are necessary right now. Um, this can change over time, but I, I think our initial, uh, from what we received from council in the past, was continue to have the streets department do the operation and maintenance. We do transfers into the fund, basically transfers back out uh, to, to cover that work. And then we raise capital funds with the fees and then try and go out and um, get uh, grants to build that. We've done some pretty substantial projects with DOLA grants and matching funds. Uh, this enterprise fund or this <coughs> department is not going to get up and rolling in a short period of time. I think we need to be realistic and realize it's going to take a little bit, but if we can utilize the transfers from the street department and then back into the street department, utilize that money for the streets and not completely develop a new department. Uh, makes sense. I, I mean, then we tra can do a gradual transition over the next couple of years to be a full-fledged uh, department. I mean, it, it, it's a huge elephant to eat right now, and we need to do it, look at it as a, do it one bite at a time. I think bonding is not something we should just, in my opinion, jump right out and do. Um, Utilizing our matching grant capabilities um, has served us very well. I think we save a substantial amount of money from the, what, the look of what we're uh, doing, looking on the bonding of what Jeannie's put together. We're paying five million on a 10 million. <coughs> Pretty substantial uh, amount of money. And I think with that, even over time, you'd be hard pressed for the inflation to catch up with that, um, especially when we can throw into the mix the potential for um, grants. We're going to have the Department of Transportation is going to be doing the interchange, which is going to bring up part of our uh, stormwater conveyance to the river and get it back up. Then we can start looking at, the, at some of the other areas. It's just something that needs to not get dropped. We've had drought, rains and floods got forgot about, and we get three inches of rain in a couple hour period. Right. Okay. Everything fills up or ever has problems. Some of the areas are, are even a little, little worse, but I don't, I think we do look at, uh, trying to develop our fee structure, um, get it rolling. Um, I imagine you're wanting some sort of transfer numbers, or do we keep it in the street department, or do we utilize the <coughs> sewer? Is it, is it yeah. Well, and what we have to do to develop the enterprise is we, we, we put it in the sewer fund. So when you look at the sewer budget, there's two parts. There's the treatment plant and there's the collection there would be a separate fund uh, or part of that fund which would be stormwater and we would recognize revenues that come into that and that's where we would account for any transfers that go on and I guess that would be the first question is council okay with us transferring out of the general fund into the sewer fund for stormwater um, money to continue to do what the, the streets department is already doing with operation and maintenance what that does is it 
uh, allows the money that's collected from the fees to go directly towards capital as opposed to operations and maintenance at the beginning. So I guess that would be my first question. Is council okay with that? The, Are there any questions about that? The transfer of funds to get started on projects? So, um, there's two sides. You've got capital, which are the projects, and then you have operation and maintenance. Once we create an enterprise, that enterprise is responsible for all functions. It's responsible to pay for operations and maintenance, and it's responsible to pay for capital. So we can't continue to do it in the general fund. It has to be paid for out of the enterprise to meet TABOR requirements and uh, se segregate those two things out. So what we can do under TABOR is transfer no more than 9.9 percent of the total revenues for the year over into that fund to allow the operation and maintenance to continue to be done by the general fund. It's an accounting requirement because of TABOR. I know it seems kind of silly, but it, we have to segregate those funds and demonstrate that we aren't transferring too much out of a, a tax account into a fee account or a, a, a enterprise account uh, under TABOR rules and at the same time we can't allow the general fund to do the work for something that's been established in an enterprise because then we run afoul of TABOR. So the idea is on operations and maintenance and that, that's my first question. Under operation and maintenance are you okay with us transferring that money from the general fund to the uh, stormwater enterprise to cover operation and maintenance costs that are done by the general fund? And, and it's not monies we, it, it's, it's just it's taking, a, it's slicing off a part of the streets budget or yes. revenues yes. and putting it over and it's not like we're saying we're going to take money we're, that, we're out taking of money reserves. we already spent the money we're already okay. spending to do it will be transferred over into the enterprise so we're not creating new money that's going over there it's current money that we're spending will go into that enterprise and it's for accounting purposes so that we can demonstrate that we're compliant with TABOR does that make sense that's a good question very good question so is council okay with that? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> one down. Okay, the next one. So the second one is, as far as the way, the approach to these projects, um, are you more inclined to have us put something together that is a build up capital funds, pay as you go, versus bonding? Can, can I ask a question about that? Sure. Sorry. Um, so, I, I'm in favor of pay as you go. However, um, are there projects that really have to be done immediately that it would be more beneficial to our residents to take out maybe not 10 million, but enough to get those projects done and bond those and then do the pay as you go for the other stuff? Mm -hmm. There, there is a possibility that that would come up. There may be a, uh, a situation where we would have to do that. So, for example, if CDOT comes in and says, we're doing this, this, and this, and we're like, well, while you're doing that, we want to do our project, and our project's $2 million, and we don't have the money to get it done right away, we may bond to do that. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is anything that you bond underneath that enterprise will limit the overall bonding capacity of the enterprise. So if you need an improvement at the uh, wastewater facility that has to be bonded, all of those bonds are going to fall under the sewer enterprise. So you also want to be careful that you don't over bond uh, or bond beyond your capacity uh, and affect that other side of the of the enterprise. The other reality with a bond issue and uh, typically it'll be attached to a very specific revenue stream. In this case, stormwater, whatever that ends up being, that revenue that comes in for capital projects, um, the bond market more or less requires that fee to have been collected over at least a one-year period so that they can feel comfortable knowing that that's what the revenue will actually be. We can't just say, you know, we're going to raise X number of dollars and therefore we're going to bond because we'll have enough to pay for it. <coughs> the bond market's going to require that we prove that that's what we've collected. So even at the very minimum, the soonest we could possibly bond in any money with this revenue source would be a year after it started collection. And another thing that's really important to note is that council isn't bound by this direction that you give tonight. So uh, in a year from now, two years from now, there may be things where council says, you know, yeah, this was our plan, but you can change your plan. You can do something different. Something might come up, an opportunity might be there. Um, what you say tonight doesn't necessarily preclude 
future councils or yourselves, even in a year from now, to change your mind on how we approach things. What it, what it helps us understand is understanding the model that we need to start planning for in developing the projects moving forward. Uh, because that's going to have a huge impact on, on Brad's workload, uh, understanding how what direction we're going to be going. Is he going to be looking at $10 million in projects in the next two years, or is he going to be looking at $2 million worth of projects with matching funds over the next two years? I think that's really why we're asking this. It's an operational <coughs> question, not so much the development of the, of the enterprise question, because that helps us with our planning uh, moving forward. So, Bottom line is you can change at any time. We just wanted to make sure we understood that you wanted to continue to go forward as we are going forward. You can always change down the road if that's what you'd like to do. Unless we bonded $10 million. Unless you bond $10 million. Change our mind. And then you, yeah, once <laughs> once they give you that money, they don't no. get, let you give it back. <laughs> they let you give it back. Uh, they just want their mind. pound of flesh. <laughs> Are you well, okay with part of it is if we don't, and if the bottom line comes down to the stormwater utility has to be developed because we won't get any more matching grant funds right. ability if we don't. We've already been told by DOLA that's a given. Yeah, if we don't do this, we one of our major um, grant providers it will not give us any more grants. So we will be stuck trying to, well, and, and for those new or on council, the other option is to bond out of the general fund. And to do that, you'll have to go to a vote of the people that would allow that to happen. And you would be taking then current funds and competing for funds that are currently in the general fund to pay back that bond. So. That's, that's the downside to that. And, and that, the, um, <coughs> the ad hoc committee uh, voted against that plan for a couple reasons. One, they didn't think it would ever pass uh, to, ha to raise that money. Uh, and the second uh, part of it was that it doesn't provide the necessary additional resources that are, are needed to address this problem because there are all kinds of other problems that the city's trying to address, like streets. So. Doesn't rain enough in November. That's right. Doesn't rain enough in <laughs> November. So I, I think we, if you guys are okay with this moving forward uh, with those two points, that we will um, continue to pay as we go. And uh, the other one that I just totally forgot. Uh, I don't know. I know we got it. I, you're recording this, right? You got all the minutes. We'll go back and check the minutes. It's been a long day. Yeah, the transferring. That's right. Thanks, Jason. Uh, the transferring. So we've got those two discs. Now we're down two. Now, I, here's one that's really important. Uh, and Brad's p worked and Chelsea's worked really hard to come up with a characterization and um, a class rate classification. This one is a, could be a little more uh, complex. Uh, Brad's put together some good uh, uh, forms that kind of explain that in your packet, but I'll have him come up and kind of walk you through those and, and answer any questions you have. And really what we're looking for is direction on the classifications. Do these <coughs> classifications make sense to you? We love zoning. <laughs> we love zoning, yeah, let's head back. Zoning. Um, so in your packet, you should have a nice colorful a uh, little memo and most of this is kind of just responding so to some of the items we discussed back in April. Um, one is is addressing in the city be assessed to a fee with a hybrid characterization that would be using zoning and the actual use of the property. Um, we did a lot of research and coordinated with the Morgan County Assessor's Office and their data and how they track properties and how they assess them um, which we thought oh this can be great. Um, we can use theirs because they're the keepers of all properties. Well, we found out that there's over 25 different land use categories that they use. Um, <laughs> so that would be a whole lot of um, rate structure setups. Um, at the same time, the city of Fort Morgan zoning has 11 separate zoning districts. Those are in your packet. And as we go through it, you'll understand the color distinctions. Um, many of them operate generally the same and the way the properties are utilized and developed are generally the same. So we work through those so such as uh, single family residential and two family residential. There's not a whole lot of difference <coughs> in the city. So as we move to the hybrid characterization, we just had residential as its own rate category. 
So we went from our 11 and we reduced it down to five, which is in your packet. Um, those would be the ones that we're gonna discuss tonight. Um, one is urban ag or undeveloped land and very low residential, which right now there's only one and that's up at uh, River Riverside Park. Um, regular residential and then high residential, which is your mobile homes, multifamily, bigger developments. And then uh, business commercial, which would cover the zonings of general business, retail, transitional, and the majority of our PUDs are also um, involved in, in business operations. Uh, this would also include um, uh, like city offices and those kind of things. And then the final one would be industrial. Um, the reason why we categorized them again, we've discussed in the past that we're trying to refrain from spending more money like some municipalities do to analyze every single property. Mm -hmm. How much square footage they have for roof, how much they have for driveway, how much they have for landscaping. Um, so working with Brent Nation and myself, going through um, general common engineering <clears throat> practice, these kind of create enough of a balance to assign um, the difference of permeable, permeable, which is where the water would seek in, versus non-permeable, to be your concrete roofs, those kind of items. Um, and so because of that difference, one of the items we discussed is looking at that would be potentially how the fee structures may alter um, since there's a lot of different ways to do rates, we wanted to start out uh, simply using land use principles and development in determining runoff. Um, and as you'll see in your packet, basically, as we talked about from undeveloped ag would have a lower rate than industrial or higher business that is predominantly um, <laughs> traditionally got a higher runoff and more concrete and those kind of elements. Um, and that would also deal with the intensities <clears throat> as well. These items staff can track because we keep the city zoning maps so we'd be able to effectively be able to use parcel data but we could assign that based off of our zoning and then, and then reduce them which hopefully saves on a lot of administrative time and not a whole lot of different fees to not make it cumbersome for utility billing and finance. Um, we discussed previously a few would be based on the average and actual size of the building lot. Average size of all lots in the zone would be used to develop a base rate. So um, this is where it got a little bit interesting. Um, in your packet, when we were looking at all the data from the county and all the different parcels, there's <coughs> approximately 3,800 parcels in the city of Fort Morgan, city limits. Um, and we went through and we broke everything down. I went through and itemized every single parcel from the county records, the zoning that we have on our current zoning maps, um, which was really fun exercise. Um, and what we found, one of the things that became interesting when we talked about average lots that we'll use residential as an example, that if we took all the residential lots, which is about uh, 2,400 lots in the city, fall either under single family or two family. Um, and that's whether there's development on them or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, but what we found is, is some of the properties when we were looking at the average lots, a recent development that's come forward to you and was zoned and annexed was a residential area south of the middle school. Well, right now that's just one lot. And so it skews all the averages when everyone else may be smaller. Um, so we've kind of went a different step. So in your packet, you'll see the difference of, we went the, the next step, instead of just straight up zoning, we don't care the size, whether it's developed or not. The county out of their multiple land use criteria, they do keep track of what's vacant. Mm -hmm. And there was approximately, I think out of the 3,800, I think 600 lots that are listed as vacant, like vacant residential or vacant business. <laughs> so we move those manually into the undeveloped ag category. Okay. Um, so that deals with those that are still doing agricultural work on it until they plat them, those kind of elements. So the table in your packet kind of shows you that distinction between the two. One is unadjusted where we just did, didn't care whether there was a building there or not. And then the adjusted is we went through and we looked at all those that were vacant and that covered such as that the, the development south of the middle school, that went into the undeveloped category versus staying in the residential. Um, 
So that being said, when we talked about the average lots, that's what we would have to decide based off of on those averages, what we consider average. And then the decision would be if we do have some that come outside of that realm. So for residential, for example, is 0.4 acres. If there happen to be lots that are at one, do we add a tiered fee because they're bigger? Or do we just say, regardless of residential, they're all gonna pay the same? Um, and then the other part that we discussed, there's not a whole lot to add to it, was there's, we'll still have in there the right to administrative appeal. Um, some of the things they're working on, if I can say, um, with economic development, when we're going through the zoning maps, um, when we talk about we've had some zoning things with council, um, we've noticed a bigger picture that there's certain areas in town when the zoning changed that we may have an area that's all residential but maybe still listed as like a B2. And so those actually help us and actually real estate agents that are trying to insure homes and mortgages and those kind of things that those some hopefully through that administrative, we can hopefully realign those properties mm -hmm. to or corridors in town. I think there's another one that's slated as mobile home, but they're all single family homes. Um, and we could also correct that at the same time and get people in their right zonings as far as their developments are concerned. But that's another, so I've got to think of lots of other projects. So, so we're looking at going from 11 to five, I guess is making sure that we can refine it more, spread it out more, however you, but this is what we kind of worked on to us seem to make the most sense um, as far as categories, as far as good engineering practice of what you see in those variations between <coughs> those classifications. And ideally that would probably be how that rate structure would look as well based off of intensities but we want to focus on the zoning so that we don't get into he's got more concrete than this person that's what we're trying to hopefully stay away from because that's just more administrative funding and engineering mm -hmm. and then we're micromanaging every single property in the city and we want to keep our o m overhead numbers down so we can put it that money into capital and that's why we're hoping this zoning hybrid um, would work best for everybody to look at it more on that zoning versus individual properties. Are you okay with the classifications as we've kind of developed them? Does that make sense? 11 yeah. to 5 is a pretty, That's I think the way you've refined them looks okay. pretty good. To awesome. It's still cool. going to be just tough. You're good. You're still and I, I like mean, there's no way we can yeah. do every single property on, on an individual basis to establish it why even develop one? I mean, we're going to spend our resources developing, spending staff time doing every single lot. Yep. Uh, I, it's just, it's counterintuitive for what we're trying to to accomplish here. So yep. I think where you're at with this personally is looks awesome. And yeah, we don't want to get into that because then when someone adds a <coughs> sidewalk, then we got to go recalculate, and then yeah. finance has a unique number for every possible property. It's a lot of overhead time. And the direction we got in April was to try and keep it as simple as possible, but keep it fair. So. And I think the adjusted, where you did the adjusted versus oh. the unadjusted, makes a lot of sense. Okay. You know, just you know, because you're right that that urban ag totally skewed. You know, right. So as soon as they put one house on it, you know, it it, it readjusts it. So, mm -hmm. would I guess the question I had is you talked about we have some that we know that are potentially already currently zoned incorrectly. Would the intent be to try to rezone those prior to implementing the fee, or would we be looking to have them go through the appeals process to rezone? That would probably be the immediate. Um, we're looking and Chelsea's <coughs> helping it all out to um, again helping areas, but we're just finding all these connections to different departments. It's amazing. And the more we've talked with the building department on those regular um, things that people need to remortgage and those when we find and have to write a letter that, yeah, you're in B2, so if the house burns down, you technically can't build it back unless you go and so for us, I think it solves a lot of issues for a lot of people. And so whether we self initiate those um, we haven't determined that, but it does cover more than just the stormwater thing we found. It actually helps clarify, again, sign codes, all those, it ties in, the zoning right. ties into so many different elements within the city, so. But in order to do a rezoning 
before we did this would require a lot of administrative time ah. to go <laughs> redo maps and ordinances, et cetera. So. And it defeats the purpose again. So that right? might be if my budget goes a little bit higher in the <laughs> coming years, then that'll be those smaller projects that we try and do. So, so this is saying with my, mm -hmm. like my home is actually in um, business, commercial. Mm -hmm. So I would be paying a higher fee be owning three lots and having a house on a quarter of that. Yep. So you would be applying for an appeal. Yes, I and, would. And that one, and, that, and that's a great yes, one. And I'm glad I that would. example came up. And that's the good and bad with B1. And that's kind of where we've kind of talked about. It's not set in stone, but on the appeal. But if that house is surrounded by businesses, then it likely wouldn't pass because the intention is, is it's a mixed use that allows for homes and businesses versus maybe the south end of town where you have a whole neighborhood that's all single family, but it's zoned B2. Well, there, everyone's building single family, but when you have the resident, similarly, if you have a business in a residential that operates, then they get a balance. And that's why we didn't want to get into all the semantics of the actual use, which we thought was gonna work when we went and looked at the county stuff. And then when we started going, holy moly, there's 25 and they have like a catch-all, what was it, special purpose or special, and that covers everything from an industrial <clears throat> use to a fast food, it was just all over. And it was just amazing that they had. And it was like, yeah, let's kind of go back and refine <laughs> to our zoning. And then hopefully, yeah, unfortunately, we're gonna have those and all those zonings where there's a home but that's what we're trying to promote along those corridors is those live work places mm -hmm. where they're intermixed. And so, yep. Sorry, Christine. Sorry. Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the, um, the next steps in the process, if you're okay with the, the uh, classifications, the next step will be to come back, we'll, we'll provide you with the appeals process, uh, which will go into the code. Uh, and provide people a legal right to come in and appeal and, and set forth the guidelines for that. So we're working on that. That'll be the next thing that we bring forward. Um, also, before we can get things started, we'll have to combine and create the enterprise uh, so that we've got that in place. Another big job is we've got to develop the billing system and understand how the billing system is going to work because we're going to have to tie out each property to a specific bill and everything else. That's going to take some time. Um, and also, what everybody's wanting to know, what, we're not there yet, is, yeah, <laughs> what is the final fee and revenue that we're going to raise? And we'll bring that back to council once we kind of get these um, things set of how is this going to work and how much do you want to raise and what's the average price going to be per person or per classification right. and so on. So. Those are the next steps. We really appreciate your time and attention to this tonight and giving us direction so that we can keep moving forward. Were there any other questions? What's the timeline for next steps? Uh, next steps, <coughs> well, we've got January 1st to kind of have everything set. Here's how it's going to work, uh, the, the price of the, the, or the fee and the, thanks, Brad, um, <laughs> uh, combination of the, well, We've got till the end of the year, essentially. But it's gonna take longer than that to get all of the billing in place, because we're gonna wanna run a few fake bills and make sure that they're right, and that, that's gonna take a while. So I, I don't see us actually implementing the fee probably until uh, mid-2017 or, or late-2017, depending on how long it takes to get all this stuff put in. But we should have and know what the structure of everything is going to be by January 1st, as was requested by council. So. We're on, we're on uh, track for that. Well done, well done. Good. Very good. All right. That's good. Thank you. Next, we have an update on our fiber network project. Very good. Well, <coughs> you know, uh, this is something that's going to go into the 2017 budget, and we want to make sure we're keeping you up to date on it. We're going to do actually a more in-depth uh, update at the next meeting, but wanted to get this out in front of you as soon as possible. Uh, as you know, we've contracted with uh, Manweiler um, Consulting. They've come in, they started the engineering process. We're going through that whole, um, I guess that whole process right now. One of the things uh, <coughs> that we wanted was numbers so that we know what we're gonna do next year, how much it's gonna cost, and what direction we're gonna go with everything. 
Uh, we had this idea that we would go and pick a neighborhood and that we'd just do that neighborhood first. But apparently, um, fiber is very much like water lines and every other kind of lines that you put in for utilities. You, you need to build your primary lines first and then split off from there. So they've designed and developed a backbone. That's what the, the main feeders are called is the backbone. So we, we've designed, uh, they've designed a backbone, given us preliminary estimates on uh, costs for um, materials as well as potential costs for labor to put it in. So all of this will go in underground. Um, I think it's 460 strands, something like that. It's it's pretty thick chunk of fiber. And uh, the materials costs are somewhere around <coughs> 700, and the estimate is $770,000. And the labor somewhere around um, one point to 1.5 million dollars. So we're looking at somewhere between two and 2.2 million dollars uh, for the first phase that we'd like to complete next year. Uh, the lead time on buying the fiber is about six months, so we want to get that ordered as soon as possible because we want it here before construction season. We already have some of the infrastructure in the ground where we can already pull once it, once it shows up, and our crews are very busy. Uh, trying to keep up with the electric side. Uh, they will pull some where, where they have time and are available, but we'll probably have to contract out a lot of the uh, boring and pulling uh, of the tubes and the, and the wire next year. So what we are proposing, and uh, we're not asking for direction or anything tonight, but just give you kind of a preview on what we're looking at. We're, we're proposing that we uh, go ahead and move forward with the development of the backbone in 2017, have it up and running, and then in 2018, uh, have our plan to move it forward and start going out into the various neighborhoods. Uh, it's a very big project. Uh, don't know what the overall cost is going to be. Uh, I think we are estimating somewhere between 10 and uh, 13 million dollars in overall project costs. And we're looking at ways to finance that uh, through uh, public-private partnerships and other things. But the first step that we have to do is put in the backbone. So uh, we're looking at uh, that cost next year and uh, we'll come in with our overall plan probably at the next meeting to update you. But I just wanted to, I didn't want us to show up at the next meeting, which is right before the budget's adopted, and say we need $2.2 .2 million. Uh, don't want to drop that on your lap. We want to give you at least two weeks to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But we just recently got those numbers, and I wanted to bring it to you as soon as possible. So we are moving forward with the project, uh, and, and staff's very excited about <clears throat> it. There's going to be some policy decisions that we have to make. Do we want to run the whole utility ourselves? Do we want to have a public-private partnership? Do we want to, you know, how do we want to run this moving forward? But we, we know we've been looking at this since 2009. If we don't start moving forward with it, the costs are going to go up. Um, availability is going to, uh, the, the demand is going up like crazy right now. I can just tell you that. Everybody's putting this stuff in wherever they can afford it, wherever they can do it. So um, we want to just move forward with what we believe we can do right now, which is the backbone. So any questions? Nobody asking, when's my house hooked up? We're working on it. So. We're not the backbone. Yeah, you're not the backbone. So anyways, okay, thank you. Next, we have the 2017 budget calendar. Mr. Wells and oh. crew. And crew, yes. We have a lot of really fun uh, budgets to go over tonight. Uh, to make it uh, more fun, I know we've had people that have been sitting in the audience, just can't wait uh, to, uh, not sure if he wanted to talk or not, should invite him back. <laughs> uh, so why don't we go ahead and start with golf, because uh, Ty's been sitting there. So Ty, why don't you come up and present your budget really quick. Good evening. Um, first, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and thank everybody on the council. Um, it's been a good year. We've, we've had a lot of opportunities to get involved with our community this year. Um, I wrote down a couple of notes to share with you. Um, this past season, we've hosted about 30 events at the golf course, um, nine of which were directly related to charity fundraisers, uh, memorial events, that kind of thing. Um, couple things where we help with is a hospital event to raise money for our hospital, the Young Farmers Association, Chamber Ag, CSU alumni. Uh, we do an REA lineman scholarship event. 
um, the Morin County Golden Stars, the, the Getman family runs <coughs> their own event and raises money for that charity. So it's a big deal to us. Um, we're kind of happy to help, you know what I mean? Um, outreach programs, we went to the schools again this year, um, party in the parks. You'll see our birdie ball equipment tomorrow night at the homecoming carnival, the high school, which would be kind of cool. The golf team is going to use the golfzilla thing and the skeet ball thing to help raise money. Um, Brady Henderson qualified for state, so we're also a host course for the Fort Morgan Mustangs, which is exciting. Um, second and once time, again, second time to qualify for state. Yep. And um, <laughs> thanks. The That's kids the play free program, the, the chunk of funds that you guys let me use to allow kids to play free. We've had about 140 <coughs> rounds of kids <coughs> and younger that utilize that this year. Um, so we're excited about all that stuff. There's not a lot of changes to my budget going forward other than the numbers are all changing. Um, we increased the fuel line a little bit and we decreased a couple of things where we're not spending as much as we had in the past. But I think overall it's pretty similar. If you have any questions, I can certainly try to answer. Increase in gas is because we went to gas carts. Right. I just wanted to make sure we had enough in there. And actually, yeah. looking at my numbers the other day, um, right now I'm coming in under budget this year. So it, it may be a mute point, but I just wanted to make sure. One of the, the changes that you'll notice uh, this year is that we've moved the golf fund into the general fund, so it's no longer a special fund. So it's basically a part of all of the other funds within the general fund. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how that uh, adjusts the general government side of things. So all the revenues now uh, from the golf uh, department will come directly into the general fund, won't be segregated out and separate. I mean, we'll probably segregate it out as golf revenue so you can see what's coming in, but it won't be its whole, a whole separate special fund. And Ty's doing a great job out there. Do you want to tell us anything else why, why the golf course is so great? <laughs> I don't know. The greens have been great all year. Um, we've had a lot of compliments. The course has been great. Matt's crew has done a wonderful job. Um, Marlene, our cook, is leaving. That's a sad thing. Um, we do have a card and a gift for her, so any of you that know her, you might stop by and sign the card. I'm not sure when I'm going to present it to her. Um, possibly in two weeks we have one more uh, event that she'll be doing lunch for and there'll be some people up there so I might do that but um, no it's been a good year it's been a busy year conditions have been great I'd obviously like to be busier I'd like to be twice as busy as we are but um, I think we're still headed in the right track hopefully the future will be good things so, um, it's nice to kind of go through and be able to <coughs> reorganize the budget and, and kind of clean things up get rid of some light items that we weren't using and um, if nothing else for me to have a little more clarity to what you know general maintenance means to me compared to building maintenance those kind of things so it was a good process well, I golfed the DJ Basin tournament and there was a lot of compliments the course looked really really good and the greens were fabulous I mean they were they've probably been the best I've ever seen them this year and on a consistent basis um, and you know the the quality of the greens is one thing people remember so it's important that's probably more important than anything on the golf course is the condition of the greens any other question oh yeah Koga, the Koga outing you RSVP the and Chris. Is it going to be fun? It better be fun. <laughs> our course. last hurrah. That's the last event. We've got about three more. We have the Sugar Bowl, uh, another men's association event, and then the COVID. Very good. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ty. Appreciate Thanks. it. Um, switching back to the front general government. Uh, a lot of people wonder what general government is, and basically it's taking care of this building uh, and then any other uh, allocations that we have to make for services that are provided to 
this to the general fund. So for example, IT is in the electric fund, but they do work for the general fund. Mm -hmm. So when you see uh, down there that admin support, we're paying $300,000. Part of that is our cost from the general fund departments to pay for services that are coming out of other departments. That's the big cost. Um, what's not in there is you see transfer to other funds. That was the line item that would make up the difference of the cost at the golf course when it was its own fund between revenues and expenses. Now that's all in the general fund, so it doesn't come out in that line item. It's going to zero, so we're, we're cutting, that, uh, cutting that in half, you know? It's kind of nice <laughs> uh, in this, in this uh, budget. Um, overall, uh, supplies and, op and office supplies, that's what's for this building. Um, utilities for this building, maintenance general property, uh, generally for this building, uh, janitorial allocation for this building, uh, property and casualty insurance for this building and some of the other uh, buildings associated. So the building next door would be in there. So that's our general government fund. Any questions? All right, that's good. So recreation department. Um, tonight our recreation department uh, is not here. And they are excused because there is a CPRA, which is Colorado Parks and Recs Association annual meeting in Grand Junction. And we didn't realize that uh, until too late. And we have a new uh, recreation superintendent. We were hoping that uh, we could introduce her to you tonight. Uh, and maybe we can have her come back next week and introduce her. But uh, I'm hearing some really good positive feedback on what's happening over in the recreation department with Elizabeth Smith. Um, and Josh is doing a good job. And, and helping her get started over there. But uh, they're at the CPRA conference in Grand Junction today. Uh, generally speaking, I can't really answer a lot of questions on this. So if you have them, I can definitely get the information back to you. But I will tell you that it's not a lot different from what we've been doing in the past right now. Um, in fact, there are very few changes uh, in the budget from the year before. Any questions about recreation? You can always ask questions at the final presentation, so that's good. Um, moving right along. <laughs> fiber network. Um, generally speaking, fiber network is, uh, there, there really isn't revenue in there. Uh, you, you see revenue in there, but it's really uh, <coughs> depreciation of the assets that we have in the fiber fund. When we do this project with the and this will be presented uh, at the next meeting. We will move the fiber uh, fund into the electric fund, and we may call it something like, I don't know, Connect Fort Morgan, something like that. I don't know. We haven't decided really yet, but um, we'll we'll have a a different uh, name for it when we move it into that fund, and it'll fall into the electric fund. So right now it's zero. It's depreciation. <coughs> because uh, we aren't getting any revenue off of it. Uh, Riverview Commons GID. Jeannie, did you want me to explain that or do you want to explain that? I guess it's very simple. So uh, we have a bond that's outstanding on a general improvement district, which is Riverview Commons, and we collect the money uh, from the county assessor who collects it from the landowners, and then we remit, remit that as a payment on the bonds that were issued to the general improvement district for the improvements over there. Um, whatever we collect, we turn over. And so we try and budget about how much we think we're going to collect next year. And then we pay that to Pueblo Bank and Trust. So any questions about Riverview Commons general improvement district? Well, that concludes our discussion of budget items tonight. I hope uh, you found it interesting. And Oh, we're going to go over schedule a more? feast? Oh, yes. Wait, hold on. I was going to say there's a whole bunch of changes I there. Know. I was hoping <coughs> we could miss, skip that, but no. Nice try. We can't. Just kidding. <laughs> um, schedule of fees. So uh, at the schedule of fees, we've gone through that. There are some changes this year, uh, minor changes. They've all been redlined. Um, some changes in construction fees and, and uh building permit fees. So in construction fees, did we just, were the, I guess is it a completely different way we're doing the electric, mechanical, and plumbing? Was that, because we don't see what was there before, I guess. I, I couldn't relate the two. Brad knows. 
Yeah, um, in those sections, some of them were just reformatting. Um, some of the plumbing and electrical, when we had some state mandated code changes, um, some of that changed, so we wanted to kind of get that clarified and reorganized. So. And just making it But nothing work. overly um, major, and a, a lot of them, most of them are all about the same. It's just how we're calculating the numbers, I think. So. Okay. And the liquor licensing is changes from the state's fees? Yeah, yeah, that's just the state. They lowered them about a year and a half ago and then had to raise them back up. They have to keep <laughs> them at, at a certain threshold. So I'm trying to think where right now. So if you go to um, oh. yeah, the liquor licensing, you saw that one. A lot of changes to the golf fees. Yeah, the golf fees changes are, are really good. And I'll have Ty come down and talk a little bit about that. We're trying to simplify and make it easier. So I'll let him kind of explain <clears throat> that. Yeah, more, uh, more than anything, I'm hoping to simplify and, and, and develop what I call a rack rate, one green fee and then a resident discount, senior discount. Instead of right now, we, uh, we, we have to quote resident rate, non-resident rate, senior rate, then our cart fees. Um, what I'd like to try to come up with is where our green fee is $31. The resident discount is $5, which makes their green fee 26, which is basically what it is. If they're a resident and a senior, it gets it down to, what's that, 23 or two or something, which is basically pretty much what it is right now. So rather than having to ask a gentleman on the phone, well, sir, do you live in Morgan County, outside of the Morgan County? They know I'm going to charge them a higher rate as soon as they say they're not in Morgan County. Um, and I just kind of think it's not the fairest way to do things. Um, the other issue we kind of run into is our senior rate is our lowest green fee. Well, the guy from Greeley that's a senior is getting my lowest green fee. If he comes from Greeley and he's a senior, he'll get a $5 discount which will be more like our resident rate, which will be $5 more than I'm getting from him now. Does that make sense? But a senior resident still getting down a $10 discount on the green fees. So that's the biggest thing. That the other changes um, that I hope for right now, the way my rate's structured, a junior and a college student are the exact same fee, whether it's green fee, annual pass. Because we do the Kids Play Free program, which I've set up basically for 13-year-olds and under that are playing for free, I'd like to have some kind of age in there with the <clears throat> junior pass. And I'd also like to up a college pass a little bit. I think I put 255 maybe, or no, 250 plus $5 fee. So kind of like our value card scenario for a college pass. Um, the other one that I'm proposing to increase a little bit and actually reword the way we talk about them are the season cart passes. Uh, right now, the way they're worded is a single rider, uh, which I think is 310 right now. And then we have a, a couple, which I believe is 510 right now. 540, something. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to put a little bit of an increase in there um, and not still call it single rider and then spouse or life partner so that the second person gets a discount. Um, that is one of our best values. We have people that even buy the cart pass that don't ever buy a green fee pass um, because it is such a great deal. If you take the average of our trail fees and our private carts and our season cart passes, we're only averaging $7 a cart where our per person cart fee is 15. So we're only getting about halfway to our goal with that, um, those passes. So I think a little bit of an increase there may help bring up the averages. But as far as the annual passes, green fees goes, the rates really don't change just the way we talk about it. It's kind of what I'm hoping for. No heartburn by the, by the um, golf course advisory board? No. no, and really, I mean, I, the rates are almost identical when you just look at it from a discount <coughs> standpoint instead of are you a resident or a non-resident um, the rates kind of work out to almost the exact same price 
question on the uh, discounts that are cumulative, you know, resident, senior, does that also include the wellness discount or is that? We'll still leave the wellness screen fees in there. Um, they're actually as low as the junior rates. So okay. But it wouldn't be if you're a senior resident and work for the city. No, you would just pay the, okay. the city wellness you get a pick rate. One. So you we get might want to clarify that a little. Yeah, because John wants to golf for free. <laughs> What's that? I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. think I was planning on <laughs> Pick one. Pick one. The wellness green fee. Well, I just thought it listed as a wellness discount. Oh, maybe it did. And so I just wanted to make sure it was clear as to that that one does not uh, combine with a resident or senior discount. And there's a bonus S on wellness. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, I see what you're saying. We we can clarify that that you don't get multiple discounts; you get to pick one. Sorry, John. No, I believe in that case it would just be the wellness discount. You would yeah. get. Poor John. And you know that's one where really the the city wellness screen fees are not published on the website and on my official rate sheet. It's uh, something in the computer that's used when we have city folk. Up. It would maybe not even be one that we'd use the discount. Maybe we just stay with it. Very good. Any other questions on golf? Nope. Thanks, Ty. Appreciate you sticking around. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, change. So confusing. No, it's, I, thought I think, I was I think once you take out all the. I thought I was going to have a little more discussion earlier on that before coming straight to. But once the you take out all just the cross Try out. to simplify. For my staff, as well as the purpose of the website, rate sheets, that kind of thing. So uh, we're taking out a few of the fees in the library museum. Uh, it's in order to be in compliance with state grant money that we receive that covers those costs. And all the way down to the parks facilities. Yes, let's go to parks. So this is uh, prices for parks, facilities, and special events. Um, things aren't really changing considerably other than the showmobile, the $300 a weekend, and the showmobile deposit is 250 adding that in. Um, uh, adult sports, we're switching that around. We're going with what the ad hoc committee had recommended for recreation, which was that we should get at least 100% return or 125% recovery on, on adult sports. So we'll figure out what the recovery is uh, when we put together the leagues, and then that will be the price uh, of what it costs to do the adult leagues. Uh, the idea was with youth sports to make all of them consistent and the same, doesn't matter which one it is, it's 35 bucks, and uh, try and make it affordable for the youth to be able to recreate, and then with adults, um, have a hundred to well, hundred to one hundred twenty-five percent recovery, depending on what sport is and how popular it is. Any other questions? We're taking out some the senior programs. We don't collect uh, for those. For free. Yeah, that's really not a fee. <laughs> free is not a fee, so we're taking those. Out. That's a good fee. Yeah. Um, I think we're pretty much, we're making some changes in the zoning and land use code and application fees. That's all being modified and readjusted more than anything. <coughs> Questions on that? That should make it a little bit easier to look up and understand. <coughs> and I think that's it. Those are the amendments to the fees for next year. Any other questions? Okay, now the uh, portion of the budget is concluded. I hope that you enjoyed yourself and <laughs> that you had a good time tonight. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We did, it was very informative, thank mm -hmm. you. He takes his act on the road, by the way, too. <laughs> yeah. Try the chicken, you know. Next. 
Are we finished with that? Yes, we're done. Okay. With the budget forever? Next is the consent agenda, Mr. Brennan. Oh, my favorite one. Okay, tonight's consent agenda includes item A, approval of the disbursements and payroll for August, and item B, approval of the minutes of the September 6, 2016 City Council regular meeting. All matters on the consent agenda are considered routine business by the council and will be enacted with a single motion and a single vote by roll call. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If discussion is deemed necessary, that item should be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. We have no interest in separating them. No, let's go, go ahead. I'll, we'll, we'll, I have, we'll wait till he's done. <clears throat> I would entertain a resolution for approval of the consent agenda. Your Honor, I would offer a resolution approving the disbursement and payroll for August and the approval of the minutes from the September 6, 2016 City Council regular meeting. Second. <laughs> I have a resolution by Christine Casto, a second by Dan Myler. Vote by roll call. That resolution carries unanimously. <clears throat> Your Honor, if I could just back up a moment to, to the Recreation Department. Um, Elizabeth did a really good job in putting together a uh, synopsis of her department. And since she can't be here tonight, she typed it up. And I, uh, I've got it to read to you really quick, if, if you would just indulge me for a minute. Three minutes. <laughs> uh, you might think that the Recreation Department is simply sports and fun, which in all fairness, we do have a lot of sports and a lot of fun. However, we accomplish so much more than that. Through our activities and programs, we are fulfilling some human needs that contribute to individual wellness and, thri and a thriving community. For example, imagine you walk into the Senior Center. You immediately notice groups of people playing cards and pool. What you probably wouldn't notice is that for many of them, coming to the Senior Center is the highlight of their whole day. I know that because they've told me so. They get to socialize with their peers and have fun. They feel accepted and safe there. They participate in programs that improve health, boost confidence, and raise self-esteem. Through the Recreation Department, they're able to, do, able to go to things that some of them, due to finances or physical ability, would not be able to do on their own, like go watch a Rockies game or see an orchestra perform. These types <coughs> of programs and activities improve quality of life. Now consider the Armory and the Riverside Pool. Both are facilities designed for physical activity. They offer opportunities for fun and social interaction in a safe environment. Additionally, at Riverside Pool, people of all ages are able to take classes that improve health and teach important skills. Swimming, for one example, is a great skill to have. At the Armory, uh, the City of Fort Morgan's recreation programs are born. These include our youth soccer, volleyball, football, baseball, tennis, and basketball programs. Participants as young as first grade are able to enroll in these programs. For those younger than that, we have our Romp and Stomp and Miles of Smiles programs. Through these opportunities, youth are able to grow socially, physically, mentally, and experience a wide variety of benefits similar to those experienced at the Senior Center. Did I mention that we also offer the community opportunities to volunteer and contribute in a meaningful way? We have some amazing volunteers and we are grateful for them and their great service. Along with our youth programs, we offer adult tournaments and sport leagues such as men and women's basketball, co-ed sand volleyball, softball, kickball, and dodgeball. Like our radio advertisement says at, the, at uh, the Fort Morgan Rec Department, we have fun for all ages. The Recreation Department also has the pleasure of being the channel for countless community events as well as offering a few of our own, including the Live at the Park Summer Concert Series, uh, as I said, we accomplish a lot and contribute greatly to the city of Fort Morgan. What a community chooses to do with its leisure time speaks volumes and has a deep impact. Our goal is to provide world-class recreational opportunities that make it easier to use leisure time positively and in a way that benefits the individual as well as the community. Thank you, Elizabeth Smith. And I had time to spare. All right. <laughs> you can't save Thank that you. for later. Yeah. <laughs> I don't get to carry over minutes. No. Not cumulative. Yeah. <laughs> this is not like a cell phone plan. Okay. <laughs> okay, next we have public comment for audience participation. Mr. McAllister. <laughs> Seeing none. Reports by officials and staff. Seeing none. <laughs> okay, better move quickly. The report's in there. If there are any questions, we're here to answer any. 
Yeah, you can have you can have Jeff's extra time. I just wanted to wish Jenny Gubbs a happy birthday today. Yay. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Jenny. <laughs> and Brad's gonna lead us in happy birthday. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that happy um, there's work going on on 34, if no one's noticed yet. Um, I think in your packet, the city of Fort Morgan is not uh, directly going to be managing this project. Uh, Mr. Brennan's already doing a good job of helping getting the word out. Um, there is a an email and a phone number related to questions of the project. I think the media has those numbers as well. Um, US 34 FT Morgan at publicinfoteam.com and 970-427-4227. Um, we're pretty much helping out financially, as you're all aware. Um, it's going to involve repaving, milling and repaving from Main Street to past the industrial park. So that will be all new asphalt. And then they'll also focus on the much awaited 34 and Barlow intersection project. So the milling was a form of the extra grant money they had that we had to wait for so long. So they wanted to make sure they spent every dime they could. And, that's what will be happening. So you'll see they're supposed to be notifying businesses and everybody else, but um, it's CDOT's project, so we'll help where we can. So if there's any questions, just use those two methods of communication. So if they have concerns or complaints about the closures, point them to this number? Absolutely. Yep. They have their own, because of the size of the project, their, uh, CDOT requires them to have their own PIO because um, mm -hmm. it's a tier four project. So we've been, John's been working. We will still, I believe, not to speak for John, but they're gonna still provide us with the information and John will still post on Facebook and relay that through our mechanisms as well. So it'll be coming, but not necessarily always from us. So. Oh, and we won another APWA award. So but that's <laughs> becoming a norm. So nothing special to announce on that. <laughs> Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. Yes. The restoration project. Yep. So another award that we'll go pick up on November seventh. So for our and restoration of the bridge. Right? So thanks to Michael and his work with the insurance and all those things, and again your approvals to do those extra efforts beyond the insurance to make that all happen. So Great. thanks. Um, I left each of you an invite for the third annual oil and gas golf appreciation outing, extremely long title. Um, if you have any questions, I can answer them for you. If not, um, you can RSVP to Christine of Oregon County Tours. And that'll be on October 11th. Thank you. You're out of minutes. Bids, meetings, and announcements. Mr. Brennan. Thank you, Your Honor. There's only one bid currently out. It's for the Coil <coughs> Dunes Golf Course Supplemental Irrigation Supply Project until September 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Under meetings, the Museum Heritage Foundation will meet September 22nd at 4 p.m. Planning Commission will meet September 26th at 4.30 <coughs> p.m. here at City Hall, and the next City Council regular meeting will be October 4th at 6 p.m. here at City Hall. And the only news release is Brad covered in pretty good detail as far as the Highway 34 project. That's the end of this agenda. We have a executive session. I would move that we go into executive session for a conference with the city attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions under CSR section 246-4024B. I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. So move. Second. Uh, all in favor? Vote. Aye. 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 All opposed? We will go to executive session. <laughs>